Hey, welcome to today's video. Uh, we are talking about Abramovich today and his first summer at Chelsea. Crazy madness of uh, transfers, Seb. Really crazy madness. Also a world before Twitter. So it meant that every day you'd wake up and Chelsea were being linked or probably actually signing a new player. Uh, it was unlike anything most of us had ever seen before. Yeah, well, it's very exciting. Uh, thanks to you for writing it, Seb, of course. And uh, thanks to, uh, to our des <laughs> designer, Philippe, for making it. Uh, the reason you're seeing us talking like this is because today's video uh, is sponsored by Stereo. And also, we want to let you know that on Saturday, the 27th, at about 5 p.m., uh, we'll be uh, doing a little chat after some of the football. So you can join us then, ask us any questions you like. Uh, there's a link in the description of today's video to, uh, to sign up to Stereo. And uh, yeah, we'll be back at the end of the video to tell you a little bit more about it. Thanks. In April 2003, an interested spectator was inside Old Trafford to see a thrilling Champions League quarter-final between Manchester United and Real Madrid. The game ended in a 4-3 United win, but an aggregate defeat and elimination. Not that that mattered to Roman Abramovich, who had enjoyed a captivating night and left the ground determined to own his own football club. And three months later he would. He passed on the opportunity to buy Tottenham Hotspur and was also told that Arsenal weren't for sale. But in July 2003, the 36-year-old Abramovich paid £140 million for control of Chelsea, becoming by some margin the richest owner in Premier League history. Now, English football had known wealthy men before, but Abramovich, who was worth a reported £7 billion, was richer than them all put together. This then would be a new era, and fittingly, it began with six weeks of pure transfer decadence that had never been known before and would never be seen again. Abramovich reached an agreement to buy Chelsea after just half an hour of negotiations. And there was a reason for that. The club, then owned by Ken Bates, was on its knees. Outwardly, they had been a symbol of the Premier League's new cosmopolitan age. They were the club from the richest part of town who courted style and celebrity. But inwardly, bad contracts, poorly considered signings and institutional naivety had left Chelsea heading towards bankruptcy. So close did they come to it, in fact, that only a win over Liverpool in the final game of the 2002-03 season and subsequent qualification for the next season's Champions League had kept them in business. The night before that game, the club had organised for a US Marine veteran to give a motivational address to the players. And before kick-off in the dressing room, it was actually the club's chief executive, Trevor Birch, who led the team talk. It was unorthodox, but it worked. The players delivered a 2-1 win, securing fourth place, precious broadcasting revenues, and ultimately, a very different future for the club. And Abramovich would set that new tone from the beginning of his ownership. I don't want to throw money away, he told the BBC in what proved to be a very rare interview. But it's really about having fun, and that means success and trophies. And had Abramovich had his way, his reign would have begun in truly seismic fashion. A decade later, Alex Ferguson revealed that he was approached about becoming Chelsea manager in 2003. One Manchester United employee would be tempted that way, with Chief Executive Peter Kenyon taking up a similar role at Stamford Bridge in September. But Ferguson wasn't for turning. Still, it was an early indication of how grand Abramovich's plans were. And any remaining doubts would be dispelled by the time the new season began. Chelsea didn't so much enter the transfer market as stormed it. Claudio Ranieri's team already had talent, but what followed was the most aggressive period of recruitment the sport had ever seen. Abramovich may have been a football novice, but his takeover had been brokered by super agent Pini Zahavi. And once in control, that expertise remained in his corner. More importantly though, and unlike any other owner in the Premier League or across European football, Abramovich also had the means and ability to take whatever he wanted. Financial fair play was yet to be conceived, and so without artificial curbs on club spending, the only restraints came from an owner's wealth, which in Abramovich's case meant very little, and that point was made pretty quickly. Prior to his arrival, the most spent by an English club in a single season had been Manchester United's £77.3 million outlay in 2001-2. In less than two months, Chelsea, who'd subsisted on free transfers for the past 18 months, would almost double that. Now, the first shot was fired on the 15th of July, with £7.5 million spent on highly regarded West Ham fullback Glenn Johnson. 
The next day, Chelsea would make the first of two raids on Real Madrid, signing Cameroonian midfielder Jeremy for £9 million. Is it elsewhere that month, David Dunn was swapping Blackburn for Birmingham for £5.5 million, Tottenham landed the sought-after Bobby Zamora for £1.5 and Arsenal snapped up Borussia Dortmund goalkeeper Jens Lehmann on a free. As if to make the point that they now existed on a different plane, Chelsea responded by spending £31 million in 24 hours, rebuilding their left side with Southampton fullback Wayne Bridge and Blackburn winger Damian Duff, both of whom joined on the 21st of July. Abramovich was serious and his money was very, very real. With that proven, no rumour was too outlandish and so, as the players marched steadily into Stamford Bridge and television pundits puzzled over potential lineups, the British tabloids gorged themselves on what Chelsea might do next. And the answer to that came on August the 6th, with another £27.6 million spent in a single day. Joe Cole, who'd grown up a Chelsea fan, signed from West Ham and Juan Sebastian Veron moved south from Manchester United. And it wasn't even close to being over. On the 14th of August, £17.1 million was spent on Palmer's Romanian forward Adrian Mutu. On the 25th, Russian midfielder Alexei Smetan joined for a further £3.5 million. And on the very next day, the biggest deal to that point. Inter Milan's Hernan Crespo became a Chelsea player for £23.4 million. Crespo was a star of the game, and on the final day of August, he was joined by another. Claude Makaleli. Lynchpin of Real Madrid's European Cup winning side the year before, joined for £18 million. You see, Chelsea were a big club prior to Abramovich's arrival, and players like Ruud Hullet, Gianfranco Zola, Marcel Desailly, and Gianluca Vialli had given them legitimacy in the 1990s. But never had their ambition been supported by such overwhelming resources, and never had they been able to plunder major clubs in quite the same way. David Beckham's transfer to Real Madrid might have been the costliest deal completed in that summer, but of the 20 most expensive players to move in Europe during that period, 10 headed for Stamford Bridge, a startling 7 of the top 10. And put it another way, 7 transfers in excess of £10 million were agreed during that off-season, and Chelsea were responsible for 5 of them. It was remarkable and unprecedented. And it was also 6 weeks that changed football for good creating a new standard for what was required to compete at the top of the game and acted as a sort of template for super club creation. Today's video is sponsored by Stereo, the premier live broadcast social platform that enables people to have and discover real conversations in real time. And the TIFO team has recently held two live events after midweek Champions League games to discuss the results and answer live questions from listeners. And you can join us on Stereo at 5pm GMT on Saturday the 27th of February for a live conversation with myself and TIFO's Seb Stafford Bloor. Ask us any questions you like and we'll do our best to answer. And beyond our appearances, Stereo is actually a really fantastic app. The interactive listening setup is a brilliant feature. It's you can record yourself asking a question whilst listening and the hosts can choose to play that question live on the stream and answer it. There's all sorts of different conversations on a range of different topics, and if you're anything like us, once you're finished with the TIFO chat, you'll spend ages listening to the other fantastic conversations. Thanks for watching today's video.